Okay, so we do a great shift uh, from Australia to Alaska. Uh, and uh, the next talk is by uh, Professor Brian Burns, the director of the Institute of Arctic uh, Biology, uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks, uh, who is going to tell us about surviving the long, cold and dark animal strategies for overwintering in the Arctic. So the story on this actually is, you know, the bird migration from the North uh, Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere as it becomes cold. And all the birds, it starts snowing, all the birds migrate, but one little fledgling did not know yet how to fly. It fell out of the nest into the snow. And uh, it's too cold, it start, you know, it moves less and less and less. And just before it stopped moving, a cow goes by and the cow does what it does right on the fledgling. So it starts to feel warm and nice, it starts moving again and as it feels good, it starts chirping. A fox goes by, hears the chirping, digs it out of the pile of uh, shit and eats it. Now this, this story has three morals. Maybe you can find more, I know of three. So, the first moral is, not everyone who shits on you is necessarily your enemy. Number two, not everyone who takes you out of the shit is necessarily your friend. And number three, if you sit shoulder high, shoulder deep in, sh in a pile of shit, the least you could do is shut up. Please. And thank you to Mira and to Noga for nominating me. Thank you to the Porter Foundation. Yeah, so to a different extreme that we haven't heard much of. Uh, Alaska is part of the Arctic, uh, America's Arctic. And we're big as a state. I put Israel's outlines in the midst just to show you. If you divided Alaska in half, Texas would be the third largest state in the country. So my topic is how do animals survive cold winters and seasonality in the Arctic? And I'd, I'd like to um, start at the very beginning, and that's about four and a half billion years ago when an asteroid hit the Earth and knocked it off kilter and uh, made this angle of obliquity that has been stabilized by the moon that formed from the debris that came out from that asteroid. Professor Shukla reminded us of this yesterday because it's then in this tilted fashion that the planet rotating around the, the sun alternately points to north away and then uh, closer to the sun. When it's away from the sun, we have weather forecasts in Fairbanks that look like this. Basically, you take the temperatures here in the, in the desert and put a minus in front of them. We'll have uh, the first uh, winter when we were, Alice and I were in our house, it was minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 days, very cold. So my question is, is how do animals cope with such extreme conditions, cold now, uh, without food, without ability to move? What changes occur in their behavior and in the physiology? And a very simple question is, where do they go in the winter? And the question, uh, the answer for many of them that we were just reminded of is they leave, they migrate and, and move away uh, and only come back the next summer. Well, our lab uh, is not so much interested in that, but rather those animals that remain resident year-round in the winter. And um, these are ones who uh, can stay active. We have ravens that feed every day, moose that are moving through our environment. That's a rock ptarmigan that stays active and feeds throughout the winter. We're less interested in those than those that tuck away and enter this winter state called hibernation. And I define it as a, a suite of, of adaptations, both behavioral and physiological, but the net result is they reduce their need for food, they reduce their metabolism, their metabolic demand, and thus they have and gain the ability seasonally to exist simply on endogenous fat and protein or stored reserves, seeds or, or leaves. And in mammals, uh, interestingly enough, in the Arctic, this, this happens in anticipation of winter, in anticipation of what's coming. We have animals entering hibernation, females, in late July when there's plenty of food. 
but they've completed reproduction, they've added the fat, they know what's coming, so they tuck away. And um, the, what they're entering into is a heavily regulated state. They're not reacting to, to no food. In fact, they have a surfeit of food when they enter hibernation. And then we think so much about hibernation being a, a phenomenon of body temperature, but, but really I'd like to convince you in the end that no, uh, it's all about metabolic rate and what happens to body temperature is a matter of physics, not physiology. So uh, the challenges that animals have that hibernate are to either, if they can remain above the freezing point, maybe by finding thermal refugia, mainly moving water in the winter, or they're endothermic animals that can produce their own heat. Uh, that's one example, and I'll go into uh, what an a endothermic black bear does. But the other challenge is for ectotherms, ones that only gain the heat from their surroundings, and, and namely the sun, they have to cope with body temperatures below the freezing point. And that can include, remarkably enough, the ability to freeze and survive freezing. And a great example is this wood frog that actually extends its range right into Alaska and even to the Arctic coast in Canada, uh, as well as the Midwest of America. And we uh, did a uh, study on these by putting transmitters on these animals and following them where they go. They don't enter deep water. They don't go to the bottom of ponds. In fact, they just dig a few centimeters into the duff and let the leaves and the snow cover them. And it's there they become frozen. Now, we weren't the ones to discover this. That was done in, by uh, Schmidt in 1980. Uh, but what we did do is find out and extend his, his findings that when uh, animals freeze, and this includes uh, vertebrates and insects, only the water outside the cells can become frozen. If ice penetrates within a cell, that cell will, will die. So freezing is confined to the extracellular space. Now when you do that, your problem is dehydration. All that water around your cells is turned inert, and that draws water out from within cells and causes them to dehydrate. It's very much like desiccating in the desert. And animals that are freeze uh, tolerant have adapted the use of cryoprotectants, glycerol, uh, and in the case of the wood frog, glucose, blood sugar, and urea acts as an osmolite that balances the concentrations of solutes between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell to keep that cell from shrinking. Uh, and we discovered that Alaskan frogs can build up levels of glucose that are tenfold that of frogs in the lower 48, and that extends their ability to freeze down to minus 18 for seven months in a row. Qu quite a record. Uh, now, you can also survive temperatures below freezing, not uh, by freezing, but in fact avoiding that crystallization of water into a solid. And there are two ways to do that. One is by supercooling, and that's actually quite common. It's when a fluid goes below its equilibrium freezing point, but no ice nucleation occurs, and instead the water stays liquid. Uh, pure water will do that to minus 40 degrees C. Instead, when freezing occurs mostly on the surface of the Earth, it's because of the presence of an ice nucleator, uh, a seed crystal that can, can allow water molecules to organize into a hex, hex shape uh, as a crystal and grow. Um, in the absence of the ice nucleator, you're, you're supercooling and can stay uh, liquid quite low. Other animals, including uh, Antarctic fishes, but a lot of insects, uh, but not the wood frog, also can produce a biological antifreeze in which a ice nucleus occurs and begins to grow, but uh, antibody-like, these antifreezes glom on to that surface of growing ice and prevent it from expanding and stabilizes those ice crystals in their embryonic form. And a great example of, of this are insects. Insects do everything and uh, wonderful to work on. This is the larvae of a cucugus beetle that uh, is shown as an adult on the left, but they overwinter two or three years uh, under bark of leaves and do not freeze and do not allow uh, nucleation of ice through their cuticle due to the production of antifreeze that lines all the spiracles and their mouth parts and their anus and keeping uh, ice from entering in. And they actually can supercool down to minus 100 and they enter a vitrified state, turning into glass. Uh, a very viscous form of fluid, uh, also a record that, that we found in Alaska. Now for the rest of my talk, I want to uh, dwell on mammals and uh, our two uh, model species, the American black bear 
and the Arctic ground squirrel that, that Fritz just showed a picture of. Uh, but um, truth in advertising, Arctic ground squirrels are much smaller than uh, black bears. And, and this is key also to differences in their strategies of overwintering and the temperatures they form. Uh, the Arctic ground squirrel is actually a circumpolar species that occurs in Asia throughout Alaska. Uh, they're big. Any bigger, they'd be a marmot, about a, a kilogram and a half. We have animals that have lived to 10, 12 years in, in the Arctic. Uh, they're shrub tundra uh, specialists living in um, where we study them in the Tulik Field Station in the northern part of the Brooks Range, part of a network of Arctic field stations. This is what it looks like looking south to the Brooks Range across the frozen lake and there's our, our field station. And you go there in a couple of weeks here in late March and suddenly you'll see an Arctic ground squirrel appear above ground, one of the first resident animals uh, that uh, reappear that haven't um, migrated. Uh, we can catch these animals and we implant um, data loggers that measure their body temperature and let them go and then catch them again and then download what the changes in their body temperature have been since we, we last looked at them. Uh, over that time, they dig into the uh, active layer of the soil. It's not very deep um, because there's continuous permafrost there. And it's a highly seasonal environment, average temperature of minus 10 growing season, really only from June through mid-August. Um, their annual cycle uh, is composed of males emerging first in late March, joined by females. They, they do mate then. Young come above ground in June. Uh, everyone is getting fat during July and August and then disappearing into their single burrows. They always hibernate by themselves. That's not true for, for marmots. And spend individually six or seven months underground like that, not eating, drinking, uh, sometimes though um, urinating. Uh, so uh, having re, uh, implanted one of these temperature sensitive data loggers in these animals and re-catching them, this is the kind of uh, results we get. So this is from core body temperature plot on the left there of a free living animal in the Tulik field station. And you can see they're at this high magic body temperature, about 37 during the active season, but then they allow that body temperature to drop to lower and lower temperatures. In fact, down to about minus three where they begin to thermoregulate, even though the soil continues to freeze around them and get to temperatures down averaging about minus 10 to minus 15. Um, and then if we, uh, can do this for a couple of years. You can see in this animal shows a very similar pattern that second time uh, she hibernates. And in fact, here we have a, a picture of the body temperature profile of a free living animal over much of its lifetime. What it's doing literally is spending a third of that life at body temperatures below that of an ice cube. Uh, but as you can see that they're not staying at those low body temperatures of torpor, but instead rewarming quite regularly. These are called spontaneous arousals. Uh, they occur about every three weeks where they return to high body temperatures for about 10 hours, and that's it, and then go back into torpor. So a lot of our interest has been is how do they get so cold and why do they warm up so often? And I, I won't be able to give you all the details on this, but uh, the answer is these are uh, the only mammals that actually can supercool their body fluids down to about minus three. They um, do not freeze, they do not have antifreeze, and instead what they do is cleanse their body of would-be ice nucleators and come into this metastable state uh, for about three weeks at a time before they rewarm. This is metastable because if you pierce the skin of this animal uh, while it's hibernating at minus three with an ice crystal, an uh, icicle, it'll nucleate freezing which will pass through the animal, they'll freeze and die. Uh, so they need to avoid that through the winter. Um, one uh, thing I want to uh, impress upon you is how do they get that way? And uh, what's very important is that they shut down their metabolism, their rate of heat production first, then their body temperature falls. And I illustrate that by showing again the trace of heterothermy through the winter in an animal that we had in the lab where we could put them into a, a respirometer to measure uh, their energy uh, consumption through uh, rates of oxygen consumption. Here's the body temperature raising to that 10 hour period of warm uh, regular um, levels and then recooling. Here's the rate of metabolism very high as they're shivering and uh, heating themselves back up, but then it bounces around a little and then drops, and I'm gonna blow that up here, the rate of metabolism drops prior to that decrease in body temperature. So they're turning off their metabolic demand 
then they're cooling. You still won't read that in the textbooks. Why do they warm up so often? And this is still a bugaboo of the hibernation field. Lots of uh, ideas on this. We know the gene expression doesn't occur when the animals are at uh, low body temperatures. Their heart rate is very low. They're, they're using up metabolic fuels at a constant rate. They're producing metabolic end products. But um, the hypothesis that uh, Serge Adon and I and uh, some others uh, favored um, is that they're actually warming up to sleep. They're not asleep when they're in torpor. In fact, they're brain dead. You cannot measure an action potential in the, in the brain of a torpid animal below about 10 degrees. Yet, they accumulate, we think, sleep debt. And uh, we need to sleep every day, but when you're at a brain temperature, brain dead at minus three, you can go three weeks without sleeping, but then the sleep pressure becomes so high that you need to rewarm sleep it off and go back into torpor. And that's exactly what they do. And we've measured that with EEG and behavioral measurements. Um, maybe they're sleeping as an epiphenomenon of doing something else, but uh, we actually think it's the pressure for sleep need, reinforcing memories in their brains. What kind of memories does a ground squirrel have? Well, they have some uh, in order to be able to come out the next spring with their brains intact. All right, I want to switch to the human-sized hibernator. This is the black bear, also reaching up into Alaska. Uh, they overwinter in dens, also by themselves, have an annual cycle very similar to that of the ground squirrel, getting fat, entering torpor in early fall and coming out in spring. One very different phenomenon is they become pregnant. Females give birth and lactate during hibernation. Uh, how do they become pregnant during hibernation? Well, they mate in June and have delayed implantation and don't become pregnant until they're in the den. They give birth to very uh, altricial young that maybe only weigh a, a pound or so, but they nurse these young, sometimes triplets, throughout the rest of the winter without ever having a sip of water. Uh, a closed system, all they need is oxygen. They don't eat, drink, defecate, or urinate. Uh, really perfect hibernators. How do we study these? We have uh, collars on them and go find them in the wild, uh, dig out a hole there. There's the head of a very large boar black bear. You take a, a drug, uh, um, telazole, on the end of a stick and inject it. You wait the six minutes, it says. You send the graduate student down <laughs> and bring the bear back, uh, sedated, uh, where we've built uh, outdoor enclosures near our Institute of Arctic Biology, where they'll overwinter in natural conditions, but now within a box instead of in a cave. We instrument these animals. My colleague, Dr. Oyvind Toyan, has built this so we can we have telemeters on the animals, OSHA consumption, body temperatures, muscle, heart, brain waves. We know everything they're doing. We have cameras. We have sound. Uh, we can follow them 24 hours, 7. Here, then, are, are uh, traces of body temperature uh, of these bears, including during the summer when they're high. And you'll see then, during, during hibernation, they are decreasing each winter. Uh, but not nearly so much as the ground squirrel. In fact, they decrease no more than about 30 degrees, uh, averaging about 34. And they have these curious um, cycles in body temperature that we now know are not related to sleep, but rather thermoregulatory cycles of not wanting to go below 30 degrees C. Um, as Fritz mentioned, uh, black bears like humans uh, if they cool their bodies much below 30, you begin to have heart arrhythmias, and that's true for bears as well. So a very uh, big difference between the profiles and levels of body temperatures between this 100-kilogram black bear and 1-kilogram Arctic ground squirrel, they actually have the same gram-specific metabolic rate during hibernation, but it's these smaller ground squirrels with their higher rates of heat loss lose that heat and come to equilibrium at body temperatures near zero, have to deal with brain function, uh, and we get bears with their much larger mass and higher um, or lower surface to body um, volume ratio and thick fur can stay much at higher body temperatures. And in fact, what they do is sleep most of the time during, during the winter, and we've measured that. Uh, by most of the time, I mean by 80% of the day, they're in sleep, and, and that kind of um, questions some of our hypotheses about what sleep's about. Uh, we can measure metabolic rate in these animals uh, throughout the time of hibernation. Here's the body temperature trace. Here's metabolism of that same animal. And I'll just make the same point I made with ground squirrels 
is that here in this data plot, we have body temperatures of three bears as they near the date that they emerge from their dens and then stay at that high body temperature for the rest of the summer. Here's corresponding metabolic rate. It rises a little bit prior to emergence, but then while the bears stay at a constant high body temperature, metabolism, metabolism still increases over the next two to three weeks to reach these basal metabolic rates. So this shows another uh, case of this independence of change in metabolism from body temperature that characterizes the, the uh, adaptation of hibernation. So I'd like to end with uh, just talking about, uh, given uh, our audience today and interest in, in biomedical applications of what we might learn from nature, is what are, what are some low-hanging fruits of, if we could better understand the molecular and genetic basis of these phenotypes in hibernation, how might they benefit people? And I'll do that through, uh, first, this example of one of our causes of, of uh, death in, in uh, society, and that's stroke and heart attack, which is really a matter of, of supply and demand. You must maintain a, a blood supply that equals your metabolic demand uh, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Well, if you have a heart attack or a stroke, you've now diminished that demand, and you're in disequilibrium, and you're in trouble. You call the ambulance, you try to get that blood supply back up to meet the metabolic demand. Um, but what if, what if, we had a way to reduce the metabolic demand as, uh, of a patient as a first responder to reestablish the equilibrium. Now what we've done is stabilize that patient, put them into stasis, uh, and now at this lower rate, uh, increase the golden hour from which if you can reestablish blood supply, your outcomes are better to a golden day, a golden week, maybe a golden three weeks. What I'm talking about is, uh, what these ground squirrels do, they drop systemically their, each cells of their bodies need for oxygen from a central nervous system command and can reverse that. Well, how do they do it? And if we knew how they did that, could we uh, establish that in people, also let them cool some, which is called temp targeted temperature management, uh, even in the case of an ICU or a brain or, or open heart surgery. I think that's a big hanging fruit that, uh, if we could understand, would revolutionize emergency medicine. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but uh, uh, you take a blood sample from a hibernating ground squirrel and it won't clot. You, you can try to make it clot all night long and it won't. In that, their heart was only beating three beats a minute, the blood pressure is very low, the sluggish flow. Normally that would cause thrombosis in, in people. It doesn't happen in ground squirrels. Um, and there's some knowledge about changes in the blood uh, cast coagulation cascade that causes uh, clots that is different in hibernators. But, you know, how much do people spend on anticoagulants? Uh, and most of them are rat poison. Uh, what if we could learn a natural way of preventing clotting? We don't know how to do it, but I think that's a, a good fruit. Uh, hibernators only burn fat. Uh, triacylglycerol fatty acids. They don't burn protein or sugar. And uh, we actually know that that's a, due to a genetic change in pathways. Uh, glycolysis is shut off. Uh, fatty um, uh, routes of uh, metabolic fuel use are turned on. That's protective in its own. We already knew that. But we don't know how to switch those kinds of things in humans, though we do know that if you can just feed uh, an isolated heart with a lipid emulsion, uh, um, which you can buy over um, the counter now that it, it uh, enhances cardiac performance even in the absence of oxygen. That's a good one. Um, when animal, when hibernators rewarm, they're uh, using what's called brown fat. And brown fat is a protein-like, fat-like cell that's heavy in mitochondria that uh, is uncoupled, uh, the mitochondria are uncoupled from ATP production, yet they pump protons back and forth and that creates a lot of heat. Uh, Small mammals have those throughout their life. Human babies have them, but it was thought that humans lost brown fat as they become adults. We now know that's not true, and some adults uh, continue to have brown fat and use it. Guess what? They're really skinny. And uh, how could we transform our white fat or our progenitor cells, brownify it into, into brown fat, something uh, hibernators do on an annual basis uh, and use that for a treatment for obesity? That's a good one. 
or uh, these uh, ground squirrels and bears uh, have what we call healthy obesity. They naturally become very fat during the summer. They do not suffer from cardiovascular disease or problems with diabetes. Uh, perhaps a microbium, which we've heard a lot about uh, in this session uh, yesterday, uh, could uh, help uh, in making that a healthy state. Could we, could we transfer that hibernation microbiome into uh, uh, making people who, who are heavier, healthier? And um, finally, uh, believe it or not, uh, we know that in humans, uh, uh, the tau scaffolding protein in the brain uh, becomes hyperphosphorylated as a unidirectional move into dementia and Alzheimer's. Can't be reversed. But ground squirrels, when they go into torpor, hyperphosphorylate the very same protein, the tau, to stabilize their brains at these low body temperatures. And then as they rewarm, they can dephosphorylate those tau proteins and come back to normal function. Um, can't do that in humans. Ground squirrels, it happens in bears as well, can do it. What are the molecular mechanisms by which they do? Could we apply that to people to prevent uh, dementia? Um, so, um, oh, so, sorry, there was one more. Uh, while these bears and ground squirrels are in their caves, they're not moving, they're not exercising much, uh, yet they do not suffer from disuse atrophy of either their muscle or their bones. If we go into the hospital and are recuperating, we'll lose muscle and bone mass over a matter of weeks. How do they protect those tissues? Somehow they hijack the sensors that they're under a load to pretend that they're exercising while in hibernation, and they maintain muscle and bone function. Wouldn't that be useful for humans? So that's a handful. There's another bushel, I would uh, uh, suggest, of other phenotypes in these remarkable animals uh, that have evolved these adaptations over millions of years that if only we learned the mechanisms of, I think, uh, would be very important for human health. Uh, we just sequenced the Arctic ground squirrel last summer. The black bear still has not been sequenced. We don't have a lot of the tools we'd like to have, but we hope we will soon. Uh, with that, I thank my collaborators and, and your attention. Fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, two maybe naive questions. Why can some mammals do these crazy things and others can't? I mean, why can't we hibernate? Would be an evolutionary advantage, I would think. And second question, um, does uh, torpor delay aging? Do um, animals that have longer torpor phases live longer? The answer to that is yes. So, um, thank you. Yeah, I'll go back. Okay. The answer is yes. Uh, the more time you spend in torpor, the, the longer you live. Those two are correlated, and while you're in torpor, telomere length stays long. Uh, you don't even show some of the aspects of cellular senescence. Why don't humans do it? Well, primates do. Uh, the fat-tailed lemur in, um, in Africa can hibernate, and, and they're within our lineage. Uh, as Fritz said, about 50% of mammals are thought to hibernate. But I can't. Not yet. <laughs> I hate to tell you that your first fruit has already been looked into. We do take people who have had strokes and heart attacks, and acutely there is uh, temperatures are lowered to give them some time to recover. It's not terribly successful. It's not universally done, but it has been looked into. Yet they, we know that, and they shiver though. They try to they try to bring their body temperatures back up. Uh, hibernators don't. So, you know, how do they turn off that shivering response and allow their body temperatures to cool? We, we can turn off the shivering response too. Right, but with drugs. So, so I have two short questions. One is if you bring a, one of these bears to a warm environment like in a zoo or something, would it still go through a hibernation or will you, or will you lose the hibernation? Largely you lose it. So that's a great question. And, and Florida, uh, black bears naturally live in Florida and they don't hibernate. So they're much more facultative as a species. Is, Ask the same question for a ground squirrel, they'll hibernate no matter what. Uh, warm temperatures, plenty of food. They have, we learned from NOGA about circadian cycles. These ground squirrels have circannual cycles, endogenous calendars that put them into fattening and hibernation and the reversal of that uh, throughout their lifetime. So also, with regard, a second question has to do with wound healing. 
if an animal is injured before it goes into hibernation, will the wounds heal? No, they don't, and their hair doesn't grow either. They're, they're, they, during those arousals, we do see some responsiveness and some inflammatory response, but not during torpor. And have you, you mentioned the microbiome. Have you looked into the microbiome during hibernation? Yeah, I haven't. Hannah Carey at Madison has, and, and Chris Donaldson at University of Alaska Anchorage is looking at that. They do change. Uh, they tend to favor species of bacteria that live off of mucus and slough cells rather than other kinds of foods, but um, it's very complex, as I understand. Yeah. By the way, um, I suppose it's not a very high priority, but... Uh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know it's not a high priority, but is there any uh, research going on about how animals are going to adapt to climate change? Yeah, we are looking at that. Um, less so um, the kinds of hibernation, but the timing of when they go into hibernation and when they come out. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely being affected. Uh, curiously, at our field site in the Northern Brooks Range, uh, springs are coming. Springs are coming later. We're getting a, a greater frequency of, of spring snowstorms, and that's affecting not the timing of when males come out of hibernation, because they actually come to high body temperature a few weeks before they come above ground to undergo puberty. It takes three weeks for spermatogenesis. Females uh, can become fertile in two days, and they look for when the snow is melting before they'll come up. And in these snowy springs, the females are being delayed by one, two, even three weeks before they come up. Males have been up the whole time. We're having a mismatch between the sexes and the seasonal timing. That in one particular year, year resulted in a lot of male death and females that never became pregnant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we are running out of time, so I'll be very brief. And I can only add to the hibernation thing that, yes, people can go into hibernation, and actually all our parliament members do that when they go into session. Uh, this is a scientific proof. Okay, uh, the last talk is by uh, Professor Ivan Levin from the School of Zoology uh, in uh, Tel Aviv University, and he will uh, talk about sugar as a source for antioxidant for nectar rivers, which I don't know what it is, but maybe I will learn from the talk. Please. Not professor yet. Uh, it was written professor, so <laughs> So I'm a new faculty in Tel Aviv University, and my lab is uh, the Nutrition Ecology Lab, and uh, we study nutrition through uh, extreme models of uh, physiology or uh, nutrition in animals. And I'll talk about sugar today. I really love sugar. Uh, I think sugar is a magic, it's almost alchemy. Uh, sugar can turn into everything in your body. Uh, and there are many animals that adapt to feed on sugar. Uh, we call them nectarivore, uh, animals feed on nectar. And there is a beautiful co-evolution between plants to animals. Uh, uh, plants produce the sugar as nectar. Sh ne nectar is basically water with sugar and some amino acids and <laughs> Uh, some other stuff in very low amounts. Uh, and the animals uh, feeding on this sugar, they have a beautiful adaptation to get the sugar, like this beautiful tongue of the bat, the nectar feeding bat, or the uh, beak of the hummingbird. But animals feeds on nectar usually have the most extreme metabolic rates, high metabolic rates. Uh, it's especially because they have to reach the flower, they have to fly, and then they have to hover in front of the flower to get the nectar, which is extremely expensive and demands high metabolic rates. Uh, as Brian said before, insects can do anything, and there are many insects feeding on nectar. And the most extreme high metabolic rates measured in any creature are in the, uh, among the hawk moths that you see here, uh, in Ibu Rafrafim. Uh, they hover in front of the flower, they send their uh, proboscis into the flower, and, uh, and they uh, suck the nectar from the flower. And this hovering flight is very uh, energetically expensive. So uh, during my postdoc, I did a, a side project on uh, what fuels are used for this very high metabolic uh, rate demanding uh, flight. And I tried to, to see what happened, how the carbs are used in these animals. So I did the basic thing. I put the animal inside, inside a metabolic chamber. Uh, I know the concentration of the oxygen goes inside the chamber. And I measure the difference in oxygen at the exit from the chamber and the carbon dioxide ex exhaled by the animal. 
So basically, uh, by knowing the difference between the oxygen used by the animal and the carbon dioxide exhaled, I can calculate more or less what are the fuels uh, that the animal use. We call it a respir respiratory quotient, or RQ. I'll use RQ uh, from now on. And if the ratio is 1, I can tell that the animal is burning uh, carbohydrates. Well, if I measure your breeze now, uh, I guess from, because we ate like an hour ago, it should be 1 for, uh, for, uh, for us. If the animal is burning lipids, it should be 0 0.7. Usually you see it uh, after star starving for a few hours in humans. And if it's mixture or if it's protein, it should be around 0 0.8. So again, I put the HOCMOS inside this metabolic chamber, I measure the RQ, and I got this value of 1.7. So as a scientist, when you get these high values, you blame the instruments immediately. And uh, I blame the instruments, and I change everything, and I calibrate them again and again, and then I wrote to the company, you sold us a malfunction analyzer, and they change, send us a new one, and again, I measure, again, I get this very high value. So I tried other lepidopterans, uh, other uh, day butterfly, monarch butterfly. Again, I put them inside the metabolic chamber. And the RQ is, again, 1.6. And I struggled for a few months with this problem in the machine. And then I had an idea, maybe I'll take an animal that I know the RQ, that they burn all, always the same uh, metabolic fuel, and I put it in the chamber. And actually, there are such animals. Uh, bees, they are only burn carbohydrates as fuel. So I just step out of the lab. There is a beautiful Vitex Siach uh, Avram tree out of the lab. And I took a xylocopa, a carpenter bee, put it in the chamber, and beautiful RQ of 1. So all the measurements of high RQ are real. It's not a problem with the machines. Uh, and in the literature for the last 100 years, it's written that when you measure RQ above 1, it means that the animal synthesizes fat. But if you check the chemistry of fat synthesis, there is no extra carbon dioxide coming uh, when you synthesize fat. Uh, so what caused this IRQ? And I am a field zoologist, but it makes me to go into um, but metabolic uh, pathways, which was very scary. And luckily, I found a potential metabolic pathway in which you get carbon dioxide without consuming oxygen. And it's called the pentose phosphate pathway, or PPP. And in the first stage, the oxidative stage of the uh, pentose phosphate pathway, I'll zoom on this part, the first carbon of the glucose is coming out as carbon dioxide, and you get two molecules of NADPH in this process. Remember this NADPH. I will come back soon to this uh, uh, NADPH. So now I want to check if it's the pathway that uh, nectarivores use uh, when they consume the sugar. I use labeled sugar. I labeled uh, with a stable C13, a stable isotope, uh, different uh, carbons on the glucose molecule. And I fed it to the moss. They are very cooperative. When they feel the sugar, immediately they, they suck it. And again, I put the animal inside the metabolic chamber. Again, I measure the RQ. And I measure the uh, labeled carbon dioxide coming from the animal. So I made a very simple experiment. Uh, when I label carbon number one, I expect, expect it will go into the Krebs cycle and comes as carbon dioxide. But if it's a pentose pathway, I expect it to go, come also from the pentose phosphate pathway and, and to get uh, labeled carbon dioxide. So if now I'll shut, the pentose phosphate pathway, I expect the RQ will go down uh, to 1, and I'll get less labeled carbon dioxide. And this is exactly what I get. When uh, the RQ goes down, there is less labeled carbon dioxide. So now I labeled carbon number two, number, number 2 and fed it again to the moss. And now I expect to get it only from the Krebs cycle. And I expect to get a lot of non-labeled carbon dioxide uh, from the pentose phosphate pathway. So now if I'll shut it down, the RQ again will go down, but we'll get more labeled carbon dioxide. And this is exactly when the RQ goes down, there is more labeled carbon dioxide. So I can tell for sure that the uh, pentose phosphate pathway caused this high RQ in, in these animals. So uh, what does mean that more than 40% of the glucose 
goes through the pentose phosphate pathway and then goes back to glycolysis. There is some loss of energy in this process, but it gives some advantage to the animal. And what is the advantage? So one advantage can be the, re the fast remove of glucose from the plasma. Uh, it might improve also the exokinase function because it takes out the, uh, the product of this uh, process. And just to understand how much sugar these animals consume, if you compare it to you, uh, average body mass of a human being, it's like drink 80 bottles of Cokes in one meal. It's a huge amount of sugar going into their body in a very short time. But if you look on animals feeding on nectar, they have high metabolic rate. High, high metabolic rate, usually uh, it's higher oxygen consumption, and then there is high potential for oxidative damage to the muscles. And uh, animals feeding on sugar usually have, as I told you before, high metabolic rate, and maybe they use the pentose phosphate pathway to protect themselves from the oxidative damage. Uh, as I told you, the NADPH is product of the uh, pentose phosphate pathway. NADPH is a donor of electrons, so it can uh, uh, be relevant for anabolic process, but can function also as antioxidant itself. And uh, people, there are many people with deficiency in this pathway, in the pentose phosphate pathway, and these people are very uh, sensitive to oxidative damage. For example, if they consume faba beans, that has uh, uh, oxidative uh, uh, agents in it, their blood cells can explode and they call them uh, hemoly uh, hemolyza. Uh, but they are also resistant to malaria because if a um, malaria uh, parasite attacks their blood cells, their blood cells will explode and the, the uh, parasite will not be able to develop in their bodies. And they're also resistant to uh, many different kinds of cancer. And maybe I'll talk about it a little bit at the end. So I went back to the moss and I start to check if they have uh, their flight muscle, if they have uh, more oxidative damage uh, to the flight muscles when they fed and unfed. I did a very simple ex uh, experiment. I took two uh, groups of one day old moss, one group fed with water, one was fed with sugar, and I let them fly on the flight meals for four hours. So you see that the group that fed with sugar were flying almost double the distance. So I expect to have more oxidative damage to their muscles. But when we measured the oxidative damage, even they were flying more, the, the fed, sugar-fed group had much lower damage to their muscles uh, compared to the water-fed uh, group. So they were protected from the oxidative damage in their muscles. The next step was to check the glutathione levels. Glutathione is the strongest antioxidant that we have in our body, uh, and it's charged all the time with NADPH uh, and to this active form. And when we measure the uh, levels of uh, active glutathione, the reduced form, even in the, uh, the, the sugar-fed group were flying more, they had more of this active uh, glutathione in their, uh, in their muscles. So we got back to the literature and we start to look for uh, papers in which people measure IRQs. And here you see from hummingbirds and for sunbirds, Sufiot, uh, in both they measured IRQs above one. And uh, these two papers, they uh, say that it's probably a, f a f lipid synthesis. The same for nectar feeding bats, IRQs about, uh, above uh, one, about 1.7. And I suggest that animals, when they need to perform in a very high uh, metabolic rates or before they have a very high demanding performance, like for long distance integration, they will consume carbohydrates to uh, build this antioxidant potential to protect their, uh, their muscles. You see it very nicely in locusts. Locusts, before they start their migration phase, uh, they feed on high carbohydrate diet. The same for butterflies and songbirds that usually feeds on insects during migration. They move to carbohydrates, and I suggest that they build this antioxidant potential uh, before flight. <clears throat> now we are testing this uh, hypothesis in uh, the oriental ornets. They have very interesting biology because they alternate be from protein diet as a larvae to uh, carbohydrate diet as adults, and they lose all the ability to uh, process uh, the protein as adults and they depend on the sugar produced by the larvae 
as their uh, metabolic fuel for their uh, performance. So, uh, for conclusion, uh, pentose phosphate pathway is a generator for antioxidant activity, and uh, it enables the very high metabolic rates that you see in animals feeding on sugar. So, like the common knowledge that there is a lot of energy in sugar, and animals feed on sugar, they are very active because of this energy. And I suggest that it's, it's a wrong conception. Uh, actually, there is much more energy in fat than in sugar, but if you consume sugar, you can produce this antioxidant potential, and then you can allow yourself to work in very high metabolic rates. And thanks to my collaborators, and there is some time for questions, I think. Uh, I guess it protects everything. Also in humans, I suggest it protects blood cells. This is why when you, you have deficiency in this pathway, uh, your blood cells are not resistant to, to... And also, all this fashion of antioxidants, I think it's wrong in our food, because even vitamin C needs the NADPH to, to be active. So it's more important the sugar in your diet than the antioxidants themselves in your diet. For antioxidant protection. These are good news. It means sugar is good for you. Sugar is good for you for sure. <laughs> you know, it's unlike what they say that the, because they say that the, everything that is good for life is either unhealthy, immoral, or illegal. So this bypasses that. Or fattening. Sorry, I forgot to. Yeah. No, I think it depends on the expenditure. So I think it depends on the, your uh, natural history. So uh, for humans, we work in very moderate metabolic rates. We are in, so, of course, we don't need so much sugar. Uh, for animal that needs to fly for a long distance or to be active uh, in a short time, it's so been. So for marathon runners, I suggest uh, that for any athlete after doing the. the uh, the marathon, you need to put back sugar because it helps your body to build uh, the defense against all the radicals that uh, build in your body. So sometimes you find animals that are exhausted and uh, even they have a lot of fat and some sugar water can uh, make them to, to go back to life. And it's not because the energy, it's also, but it's also because it helps them to build the antioxidant potential. So thank you all for a great session and uh, now I think if we can sip some coffee, I'm not sure because there is the uh, trip up to Masada that is going on, okay? Okay, uh, no coffee. I don't know about sugar, but no coffee. Um, my name is Guy Stiebel. I'm from uh, the Department of Archaeology. Uh, in Tel Aviv University and the head of the expedition here and I would like to take you now to my lab uh, in the field to go up to Masada. We have uh, less than two hours to go up and down and conquer it and speak about life in extreme conditions but uh, referring to humans so please follow me. Yeah, yeah. Two minutes for toilets and uh, a bottle of water outside. The most troubling thing at Masada, we never found the ancient latrines, but... <laughs> 